start um, just to, to get us on track to being not, you know, have, respecting everybody's time and, and then that sort of thing. Um, welcome. Uh, we're glad to see you here. That side's less full. If you want to go around, it doesn't have to be. Um, so I begin, um, it is my pleasure to in introduce you to Bay Area, Bay Area artist Indira Allegra. I was introduced to her work uh, by several artists um, that I had asked to participate in the current show in the NSC Art Gallery, Contemporary Fibers. Uh, they let me know that her work was important to include in this show, and it is. Um, I'm profoundly grateful to have been able to include her work and be able to sit with it during the show's run. I'm also amazed that we had the opportunity to ask her to come in because she is a Bay Area artist. Um, and I will get to that in one minute, why she's here. Um, and Dear went to uh, Portland Community College. I always love to tell you all when the community colleges are involved, right? So um, for a uh, for sign language interpretation, before receiving a BFA from California College of the of of Art and it Craft, used to, it used to be California College of Arts and Crafts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now <laughs> they, cool. they took off the crafts. Yeah. She has had numerous artist residencies, including recent residencies at the Headland Center for the Arts, Jurassi uh, Resident Art Program, where she received a Lava Thomas and Peter Danzig Fellowship, Takt Residency mm -hmm. in Berlin, among others. She was a, nomina a nominee for a Sika Art Award from SS SF MoMA. Big deal. It is a very big deal. And a finalist for a Tosa Studio Award for Minnesota Street Project in San Francisco, and received a Creating Queer Community Grant from, queer cultural, from the Queer Cultural Center in San Francisco, mm -hmm. as well as an Oakland Individual Artist Grant. This last year, Indira was honored as a woman to watch from KQED Arts in San Francisco. She has participated in many group and solo exhibitions, including a solo show, Body Warp, which is currently at the Alice Gallery in Georgetown. Yeah. Uh, she, we're, we're lucky to have her here because she set up that show. She's doing a bunch of activities this week around that show, including on Friday, she'll let you know, but mm -hmm. on Friday night there's a performance uh, associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, this show opened last Saturday and I had the privilege privileged to see the show and highly recommend it. The exhibition includes a photo series, video, sculpture, and live performance on Friday. Indira Allegra's work melds textile work with performative document, documented in photo and video. To paraphrase from her artist statement, she is an artist who activates tension as a creative material. Mm -hmm. She works with vulnerability, empathy, and, among, and making visible the invisible. She is fully engaged in inclusion. All of my conversations with her to get her here have been all about inclusion, so it's been quite lovely. Before I present to you to Indira, uh, to Indira Allegra, to, to offer, I offer acknowledgement that this event is happening on Duwamish, Tulalip, and Skuk Skuquamish Na Nation territories. Specifically, this campus was an important seasonal camp for the Akabush people. Thank you. Uh, I welcome Indira Lega. Hi, and um, happy Gregorian New Year. There are many New Years, but um, for you standing in the back, you're welcome to, to come on up and have a seat. You're fine? Okay, great. Just want to make sure everyone's comfortable. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Okay, great. As if on cue, <laughs> make sure that your phones are off. Yeah. Um, take a sabbatical from social media for like one hour. And um, yeah, put it on silent. If you have a notebook, I highly recommend having it out. Many of you do already for questions. I will answer them at the end. Um, or maybe it could just be associations, things that come to mind for you. Um, who are artists or writers in this room? Hands high. Yes, awesome. Okay, good. Um, stand up for your practice. That's all I have to say. No matter what field you go into, um, to pay your bills, whatever. Some of us can sort of piece it together working as artists full time. It's difficult to do, um, but 
defend your creative time. It is so precious. And it's something that isn't always valued as, as much as it could be within the um, society that we live in. So I just offer that um, to all of you. I think that um, nonlinear problem solving and thinking is actually very important. So um, yeah, thank you for being here today. And I want to thank the illustrious tech team. <laughs> and um, yes, and Amanda, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here. And I'm sure there are many other faculty and staff that were involved in bringing me up for this adventure. So I'm grateful to all of you for that. My name is Indira, and I work with tension as a creative material. So um, tensions between intimacy and violence, or violence as an intimate act, a non-consensual uh, intimate act, um, and tensions within the body. I think that these are all uh, exist as materials that can be stretched to their limits, not unlike thread. Um, and I use weaving as a methodology to explore how these forces can be woven. And so as we walk through the presentation, we'll learn a bit more about that. I work through sculpture, installation, performance, and um, I often think of my works as interventions in both political space and emotional space. Let's see here. So I'm going to show you a quick video um, because a lot of the work that I do requires a great deal of research um, and that's another thing that I will offer to you uh, as creatives, makers and thinkers, that research should be a part of your practice. So um, when I say research, it means like actually going to see other people's shows and performances. It means going to uh, the library or your local bookstore, local bookstores, um, and picking up a text that has something to do with what you're working on, or reading some of your friend's work, buying a zine, whatever the case may be, always have your work be in dialogue with something else that's already being generated. It makes for better conversation and it expands your mind and your work as well. So I watch a lot of news, listen to a lot of news. I grew up in a household where we listened to BBC radio every morning and um, we actually had a shortwave radio in the house that shows you how old I am. Um, and so Democracy Now! is something I listen to a lot and um, this was a clip that inspired a work that I'm about to show you. As we speak with you, bring you the voices of people who've gathered here on the grounds of George's death row where the execution is being carried out, where Tri Anthony Davis is being killed. Renee Feltz is back with an update. Amy, as we understand it, the execution is now underway. And we're expecting the Georgia prison officials to come out afterwards to give us an update or a statement, something to that effect. So we want to let listeners know that we'll be providing that as soon as possible. If we can, we'll try to feed the statement from the prison officials live. Do they do this right here? Do they do this? Um, it will be over near the police officers dressed like stormtroopers. That's where the press conference is going to take place from the prison officials statement. Um, uh, I wanted to just read one interesting tweet from Representative John Lewis who's come up this evening from Georgia. As we stand here, he came from Atlanta. That's right. And he's tweeted today, we're all Troy Anthony Davis tonight. with that case yes anyone else so in, in 2011 um, a man named Troy Anthony Davis who had been on death row for 20 years was put to death now everyone from the Pope to Desmond Tutu was advocating on his uh, behalf for his innocence for a stay on his life and ultimately as we see here this is a moment wherein his body is actually being injected um, with a cocktail 
and um, they're waiting for uh, news of his, his actual death. And um, I think that oftentimes as humans we have to deal with shock and grief that's much larger than our bodies can actually even hold. So that's why we create work, because the work can actually be, or that's why I create work, is that I feel that the work is an extension of the body. It's a place for that shock and that grief to go. Um, I'm interested in weaving in particular because it's a medium that people have used to tell stories for over 25,000 years. So that's really old in comparison to writing, which is only 5,500 years old, right? So we actually borrow from the structure, the architecture of weaving to know how to write. So if you think about the structure of woven cloth, you have a weft line and you have a warp line. And think about how we write as a culture, right? So we either write along the weft line or we write along the warp line. I don't feel like, um, that's by chance or happenstance. Um, it's how we know how to tell story. And in fact, when we use the word text, we're actually invoking the Latin verb texere, which means to weave. So this like writing and weaving, um, the storytelling, this idea that cloth can actually hold a memory for us is an idea that has been, um, is very, very old and has been extant for a long time. So I think that we make images and we make cloth because we want to remember something. I think of cloth as being the original external hard drive. So we all have something that's in our closet that holds a memory of maybe ourselves at another age, um, another size. Maybe it was something that someone gave to us. It had a smell at a particular moment. And um, there's an emotion that's attached to that. And that cloth does the work of holding all of that for us. Um, um, this is Troy Davis. So this piece is St. Davis of Savannah, which was woven, handwoven on a jacquard loom um, during the uh, whole that newscast that I showed you like a clip of. Um, so I was listening to that in its entirety while weaving this. So this is woven um, entirely uh, on the day of his execution as a performance project and then also as a way for me to, living on the West Coast, be standing with people in um, Savannah, Georgia um, during this event. It's life size, so when you walk up to it, it's, um, yeah, it's like body meets body. So his last words are recorded here in cotton and 18 karat gold, so I weave sometimes with uh, precious metals as well. This piece is called Southern Pantoum. So a pantoum is a poetic structure that um, consists of quotations with an alternating rhyme scheme, so A, B, A, B, A for the writers in the room, um, and they're linked by repeated lines. In this case, the fates of both Troy Davis, so his last words on the left, and his sister Martina Carrera. Maria Davis, um, her last words on the right are um, rhyming in the sense of um, their fates. So two months after Troy Davis was put to death, his sister, who had been fighting for his um, for his stay, for his life, died of cancer. So there was a way that I felt that that um, relationship needed to be honored and have their texts be um, forevermore in conversation with each other. <clears throat> Thinking more about like the inevitable crossing of forces, this is Plain Weave Poem 1 and uh, this is hand dyed um, wool, paper, and cotton. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, y'all remember Hurricane Katrina, right? So it's kind of like the inevitable crossing of an infrastructure that fails um, like poor people and the lives of people with disabilities, elders, and whatnot. And what happens when you're living, um, living in the places where the levees don't work? Um, yeah. <coughs> 
So a way of thinking about um, the crossing of threads and the crossing of um, <coughs> sort of like our, our precarities, the precarity of our lives when we have to interface with um, social systems that are actually not designed to um, always protect or uplift um, folks who live at the margins. This is Immortal Word. Again, this is woven with silk, cotton, and 18 karat gold. The names that you see on this book box are um, folks who have been also put to death for acts of self-determination or because of their political beliefs. So as you are probably catching on, I work with a lot of like very heavy um, material, but I create other works to hold that um, grief, to hold that intensity. Um, so I think that there's something, an inherent intimacy about weaving that allows me to get like right up close to someone's dying words um, with the use of thread and that feels really satisfying to me and there's something that feels really gratifying about being able to um, memorialize. And here's, uh, once you open the book box, I don't know if anyone does book work. Does anyone do book work here? Yes, awesome. So you have an idea of how time consuming it is. Um, so when you open the box, uh, these are printed onto um, sheets of translucent crepe. And um, on each panel, there's a face of a political dissident. And so you can go through, there's like 52 in the deck. Yes. Oh, I'm just curious if the director of Possible Union was in that deck. I'm sorry, you're curious of who? Is the Italian director Pasolini in that deck? Yes. Okay. Um, I wish I had it here to show you, <laughs> but it's a rather expensive object, so it's at home right now. Um, this is a double scroll. So this is a poem that I made of everyone's last words who are in that deck. So um, one of the things, like I said, research is a big part of my practice. I spent three months in the San Francisco Public Library um, researching the last words of folks. And um, after such a length of time, the librarians there kind of dubbed me the death girl. That I <laughs> <laughs> They were really sweet. They bring like tissues by, you know, it's like hard to do. Um, and so uh, wherever there was ambiguity as to whether the last word was like, like freedom or mom, I included both um, because human beings are complicated. And um, so you'll see that the original text is in gray, but then what I, the words that I've chosen to create the longer poem out of are bolded. Um, and they're in, there's like three different languages. So it's English, German, and Spanish that's happening there. This is Plain Weave Poem 1. Um, so again, or I'm sorry, Double Cloth Poem 1. Um, so again, I'm thinking about how the structure of the cloth can sort of mirror something about the structure of um, a particular life experience. So as a queer person, I know that when I walk down the street with my partner and I'm holding hands, that feels safe in some places and unsafe in other places based on the feeling of the neighborhood and who might be there and you know uh and and what they might think about um folks of of a similar gender walking together and so there's a certain sort of like hardness that i have to have on the outside when i'm walking down the street with my partner when really internally i feel quite soft very vulnerable and so i wanted to create um a cloth book that mirrored that kind of emotional experience that I have. So um, on the exterior, you see on the right, there's um, like a very rough cotton there. And then on the interior, um, this is hand dyed in indigo. It's very, very soft. It's like the inside of your pocket. 
And so if you flip through the whole thing, it says, your palm walking straight feels like cotton lining my pocket against our gender. So what I love about uh, being a maker is that um, when you make, it's a relationship, right? So it's not just um, you deciding what the cloth will do, or what the threads will do, or what the wood or clay or whatever it is that you're working with, maybe it's charcoal, that you're actually in dialogue with the charcoal when you're making a drawing, right? And you're in dialogue with the clay when you're making a sculpture. It's not just about you, it's about the relationship between the artist and the material. And so for me, I actually believe that when I am um, making objects, that those objects are animate and they have their own things that they wanna do. Silk does certain things that cotton doesn't wanna do and like vice versa, right? Um, and I also think about the movement qualities of the materials and thinking a lot about thread choreographies. And so I'm gonna show you a series of performances that explore this idea of thread choreographies. This first one, um, the series is called Orientation to Intimacy. Let's see here. So this next, um, let me pause that for a second. 
Okay. So this next thread choreography was a commission um, from the SF MoMA and they wanted me to come in to respond to this piece of uh, sculpture in the back, which is um, by an artist named Martin Perrier. Uh, it's untitled, but often referred to as Malediction. And as you can see, there's like a certain thread-like quality to it, where from afar it looks like a solid mass, but as you get closer, you realize that it's a transparent object. And so um, I wanted to, focus on ways in which we could learn about transparency from this object. And I invited people who were in the museum to share with me something they wanted to be transparent about in their own lives. And they whispered that into my ear and I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and I won't tell you either. And I took all that information into my body and translated uh, it into what you see here. Now I can't tell you what she told me, but I will say that over the course of a half an hour, people shared with me all kinds of stuff. My favorite one um, was someone who was afraid to grow up. And this actually came from someone who um, visually, if I were to pass them on the street, I would definitely say, that's a grown up right there. But internally, that was some place that they felt like they had not arrived at yet. So I was really um, deeply moved by the level of um, honesty that people shared with me. So I'll share this with you. So you'll see that I'm motioning for her to come over and so it's so she can take the final position and at the end of the half an hour we had a sculpture garden that was composed of people in different positions in the gallery um, responding to the work so that was a lot of fun. The um, next thread choreography that I'll show you was commissioned by the Wattis Institute um, in San Francisco and this is um, a thread choreography that has a lot to do with uh, working with bedtime textiles, which is not something that we normally um, think about as having like artistic value, but I believe that art can actually be created anywhere and oftentimes we have fantastic ideas about what we want to do the next day in our studio or with our creative practice when we are in bed and resting. So the story behind this is that um, they had contacted me and they wanted me to perform at this opening but uh, I had just had surgery so I actually had a um, I've had two tumors removed from my body in two years I'm okay I'm grateful that both were benign um, but I told them I said you know I'm not even sure that I'll be able to physically make it in to the gallery but I want to do a work anyway and I actually want to make a work about that vulnerability and particularly about the vulnerability um, of a body of color um, on her own terms, you know? And um, yeah, and you'll see how I chose to do that. Oops, let's see here. Let's go back.
So I'm saying, is able-bodiedness even a thing? Is it a mythology, really? Is it a mythology, really? Is able-bodiedness real? Is able-bodiedness real? I don't know if it's real or not. Able-bodiedness just feels so temporary. Able body just, just feels so temporary. Seductive even. Feels so seductive even. I think that we're really just shapeshifters. I think we're really just shapeshifters. Shapeshifting between disease states. Shapeshifting between disease From states. Illness to injury. From illness to injury. I asked my doctor what tumors are made of. I asked my doctor what tumors are made of. She said they're made of cells that know only one kind of math. They only know multiplication. She said they're made of cells that only know one kind of math. Themselves, but I think multiplication. There's more to it than that. I think there's more to it than that. Can you tell me? Can you call me what you think tumors know? That we forget when they're pulled from the body? Can you tell me? Can you tell me what you think tumors know that we forget when they're pulled from the body? So if you have an answer to that question, you can actually write it down and let me know at the end of the talk. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you just recovered from surgery, sometimes Skyping in to do a performance can be an option as well. That goes on. Um, for the sake of time, we'll move on to this one. So thinking a lot about this theme of like cloth and intimacy and um, proximity of uh, cloth to the body. Um, this piece is, uh, let me see if I, my German is terrible, y'all. Aufenthalts Gestattung. Does anyone speak German in the room? I was living in Berlin for like a few months last year on residency. It was great. Anyway, so I went over there because I was really interested in learning more about the refugee crisis that's been happening. And um, that's actually going to be like continue to happen because people are always on the move because their countries are either underwater due to global warming or debt to the World Bank or civil war or it just goes on and on, right? Um, and so I was interested in uh, thinking about what goes into applying for asylum, an application, right? And that when someone arrives in a place where they're seeking asylum, they're forced to rehearse all of this trauma that has happened to them over again for someone else not knowing if that other person will believe them or not. It's a terrible situation that we put human beings um, through, I think. And so I began to think about other ways in which applications for asylum could be written. And because I know that text and textile are really one and the same, I thought, ah, maybe I can actually weave an application for asylum. Maybe that would be a way to answer these like really difficult questions about history and background and trauma, personally and intergenerational trauma. And I thought, wow, what would it look like for me as a person of color in this country to write an application for asylum in another country? Back in 1951, Paul Robeson was part of a group of folks that presented a uh, packet of papers to the UN, and it was called We Charge Genocide. And they went down the line of all of the human rights laws that were um, created after the end of World War II by the UN, and they said, you know, the US has got a problem because seems like the way that some folks are being treated over here, it's not just a violation of civil rights, it's a violation of human rights. And maybe there's an international responsibility to come to the aid of, in this case with this petition, of black folks, but I would also say of um, indigenous people here 
what was the international responsibility um, to act on behalf of, uh, yeah, folks like us? So I decided to pick up from that 1951 petition. And actually, I was staying in an apartment that was five minutes away from where Paul Robeson lived in Berlin. And I wove this application and I actually took it to the German government. And I said, here. And they were like, that's crazy. You can't do that. I said, well, I'm an artist, so you know, I'm taking kind of a creative liberty. And this idea is really good. And they were like, get out of here. And I was like, okay, we could just, you know, I'll just leave. Um, but this has been on display at the Center for Craft and Design in North Carolina. And um, I literally took a table loom with me to Berlin and um, that is hand dyed cotton in indigo that I dyed in the um, kitchen sink, don't do this at home, <laughs> in the apartment where I was staying. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I don't have a better detail of that for you but um, woven into the fabric are strips of my own um, passport, maps of where I have lived, other things that pertain to my own family's history. Um, in this country in response to questions that um, yeah folks might be asked around why they think other people should come to their aid since we're talking about borders and boundaries and and all of that stuff this is um, a work from a series that I, I call the surrogate series so the idea with the surrogate series is that I make these tension weavings in places where um, there's some sort of like historical tension going on that's maybe like not spoken about all the time but you can feel it I mean had, who's had the experience of walking into a room and being like whoa there's a lot going on Right, so that's a form of knowing, that's a form of like literacy, I think, that we can actually pay attention to and respond to as creative people. So this particular um, work is called Surrogate Decommissioning. This is in a former military base um, at a really famous residency that also happens to be, in my opinion, um, haunted as F. I'm not gonna say the whole word because I'm mic'd right now and I'm on camera. Um, so in any case, I'm responding to all of this very militaristic architecture um, with the lightness of, of paper and, uh, and wood. And that's all held under tension there. Another part of this decommissioning series is actually on view now at the Alice Gallery as part of Body Warp, which you're welcome to go see. Um, the stranger says it's like one of the top picks, so I guess you should go. And um, this is a, a series of, um, yeah, it's decommissioning, working on decommissioning the space. So I'm thinking of myself as moving from Weaver, which I showed you initially, to Thread. What would it be like if I was treating myself as thread? How would I feel? How would I move in a space? What kind of like elasticity would I have in this particular location? This is surrogate mother to myself. Um, so with all the pieces in the surrogate series, um, they're made of different materials specific to the tension that needs to be um, held or spoken about at that particular location. So in this case, this is a memorial to a suicide that happened on this property. And in doing a lot of research about the um, young woman who committed suicide at the age of 27, um, I learned that she was uh, she was like a horse whisperer type, so like someone who felt more comfortable with horses than she did with human beings. And um, so what you see there is 600 feet of lead line rope, the kind that you use to work with horses, and um, some old growth redwood. Uh, this particular tree actually fell down in a storm, so I was able to pull it out of the forest. and. Um, yeah, this is in, at a ranch in Northern California. This is at Jurassic. And here's a detail. What's the scale of that um, It's about as tall as I am with heels on, because that's about as tall as she was. Who, I'm sorry, who asked the question? Oh, yes. Um, 
that's about as tall as she was when she was alive. So again, doing research with family members who are still alive and um, talking with them about um, citing the project, what she liked, um, the kind of person that she was, um, yeah, and all of that. <coughs> So this is part of some of the work that also happened at Jurassic. This is on view at um, the Alice. Um, so that barn was built in 1899. The only reason that it's standing is that they're reinforced steel beams that keep it from falling down. And that's where they were like, yeah, you with the looms, that's where you can work. <laughs> I said, okay. Um, it's also a place where Pamela Jirasi, the young woman who committed suicide on the property, loved to go. It was one of her favorite places that she found a place of, as like a place of solace there. Um, so as you might be picking up on, I tend to work in incredibly haunted spaces as well. And so I also think about um, the tension of haunting um, as being a creative material and thinking about mm, how do those of us who have bodies haunt back? Is there a way that we can be in communication with um, that kind of world that we can't see? Um, and making work from that place as well. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip to Woven Account, which relates to the work that's actually in the gallery. And um, what I will say about that is uh, that in 2013, um, I was gay bashed actually in San Francisco. It does happen in the Bay Area. And, um, and after surviving that experience, I became really curious about what kinds of stories make the news, right? So like certainly no one was calling me up to say, oh and dear, what happened? What did the person look like? Are you okay? Can we bring food over? Um, no newspaper was doing that. Um, and so I was thinking about all the other people who experienced similar things to what I did and um, how their stories were told or not. And so I did a lot of research through um, the archives of local, like 16 different local newspapers to see, okay, what stories of hate crime violence actually made the news? And then where I could actually get my hands on the newsprint, I uh, hand spun the newsprint into thread and created a, um, a weaving, a shroud, to actually mark these places where the violence had happened. So it was a, a form, another form of intervention, which is why I talked about, I mentioned that word before, um, where I got a chance to go to several locations in the Bay Area um, with this shroud and by performing there, um, inform people as to what had happened near their homes, near their places of work. And um, every location that you see in the video is a place where someone was either murdered um, or barely survived, and I include my own, um, the, the own side of my uh, bashing there as well. So I will leave us with that, and then we can go right into a very quick Q&A, because I'm sure you have some questions. You have some questions? Yeah? Okay, good. Oh, sorry, that's another word. Oh, that's not it. Okay, here we go. I need to go back. I need to know who else this happened to. Where, what streets. I needed to visit places where other people were reported in the newspaper to have been bashed and survived. I needed to visit places where people did not survive. I had to mark these sites with the newsprint itself 
and to weave in the voices of those like me who had survived bashings, but whose stories never made the news. I had to make a woman a cat. or three a year, that just says to me, you're not talking about the problem. Something about strips of paper and just even seeing the sentences, you don't even have to actually know the whole story that the strips of paper are attached to, but when I was looking at them, I could read like a sentence and that have imagery of what probably could happen. Like, so, when you're in a certain environment, like, you know what street to walk down on. And if you're a person that does believe that you have a lot to lose, you, you, you operate accordingly. We have Kim Ash walking down the street. You have stepped out of protected behavior. You are absolutely a target. We had this rainbow flag that was hanging up. They tore that down. We can say something. Thank you. Um, who has questions? I have time for like three. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your subjects are experiences or people that are often far removed or are from removed from your day-to-day -day life. Do you often feel hesitant with making work about that? And if so, how do you talk yourself out of it or how do you steer away towards it or away from it? Oh, I mean, yeah, it may not be someone who I knew on the day to day, but I think just like as a human, there's something about their experience that um, resonates with my own, you know? I think in the same way that we can feel like really connected with like a character in a novel um, or in a TV show that we watch often, um, it's because there's certain like universal things that like suck about being human. It's really hard, you know? And then things that are joyful about being human too that I feel like um, one can uh, connect with. So I think this idea of um, thinking about spore or forms of speech and ways in which someone tries to take space in society with their body um, are always important to me. So yeah, it doesn't really matter proximity or temporality. Maybe they lived a while ago or whatever. It's what their life was about that I think touches me. So, mm -hmm. who else? Yes. How did you start? What was you? You know, you didn't just 
you know, what was your progress? I just, because it's so unique, but I just wondered what, how did you come to this? Are you, um, do you mean in terms of like, uh, like career-wise or weaving or? The weaving, you know, it's just like you found this way of expressing yourself. I just wondered if it's like, were you always a weaver or? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, no, I, um, so uh, writing was like my first creative form, you know, and um, like I said, I grew up in a house where we listened to the radio all the time. And actually my, um, <laughs> my dad would have us like actually listen to programs like in French and Spanish, even though he didn't know those languages, he just wanted us to know that there were different ways of speaking in other places. So I had no idea what was being said, but it was a way of being like, okay, well, um, I grew up in such a way that when I did meet people who spoke French or Spanish or German or whatever, um, or who had what I would call an accent, um, it wasn't strange to me. So I think that there was a way of being able to like connect the radio like as a medium to kind of like connect with a broader world, you know? Um, and then, uh, as Amanda mentioned, I also have training as a sign language interpreter as well, um, where I went to Portland Community College. And um, I was the first person of color to actually graduate from that program. And uh, so for me, this idea of the, or experience of the text and the body being one and the same as an interpreter feels very elegant. Right? And so I think that there's a way in which I continue to, in my own practice, make meaning through the hand and through the gesture of the hand and through the placement of my body and, and thinking about all of that. So, um, yeah, that's a very abbreviated answer. Um, my mom was also like a, uh, used the kitchen table as her beading studio. <laughs> so we couldn't actually eat there. We had to eat in the living room because she was like, no, this is my space. Um, so I think I grew up with a sensibility around like, uh, handwork takes time. And whether you're laying in lines of text or you're laying in um, lines of beads or you're laying in um, lines of thread, it's okay that it takes time. And we don't live in a world currently wherein it's okay for things to take time. Um, but I'm stubborn, so I don't care. Who else? Did you? Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, what are some of the struggles you've had as a queer artist? Um, that you feel like to be a queer artist? Who has a chair? Well, I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and how have you dealt with that in your career? Um, thank you for asking. Uh, what I will say is that. Um, when you are an artist, or as an artist that actually embodies many marginalized identities, people expect that, there's a way in which sometimes when people write reviews about my work that they expect that that's like all that I'm talking about. And um, <laughs> yeah, it literally could be like I, I could paint, or I could draw an image of this can, and someone would be like, wow, she's really deeply investigating the grief of the black experience. And I'm like, actually, <laughs> I just drew an image of this can. And so I think that there's a way in which, um, you know, around queerness, around my identity as a, a woman of color and as a woman, um, folks get lazy they think they know what it's about. They're like, oh, okay, queer. So that shorthand for this, this, and this, and this must be what she's talking about without like actually really being like, well, is it? I think about a lot of different things, you know? So I think I would say for those of you creatives in the room, when you're having like your work reviewed and, and things like that, um, and folks tend to want to be like, Oh, it just you know, it has to do with so and so's culture or this particular language or X Y Z experience. If it does, great. But if it doesn't, don't be afraid to be like, well, actually, no. This is actually what I'm thinking about. And because you do research, you will have all of these texts to back it up. You're like, well, actually, I've been reading Foucault. <laughs> have you tried it? 
you know and so I, I think that it's it's useful in being able to the more clearly you can articulate your own practice um, the sharper other people have to be in reviewing your work so was that the last question Ooh, yeah just I wish I could remember the woman's name but I just read a story about a young lesbian woman in Washington DC who was trapped in a trunk of a car and found with bullet wounds and the car had been burned. I'm wondering if you've heard the story and have responded to it. No. Um, Sorry, I don't know her name, but if you look it up. Sure. She's a young black woman in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. I think she was in her 20s. Okay. Younger. Yeah. And um, your piece just reminds me of how many stories don't get enough coverage and the violence out there. Just curious if you had responded to that particular story. I mean, not this particular one. I'm like constantly working on stuff and, and what I will say is that I have to balance I have to find balance in my own practice around how much memorial work I do because it's taxing to do that. Um, it's very difficult to do that. And so it's like, like my self care regimen has to like literally be on 10 to do like this kind of work emotionally. I sleep a lot um, because it's tiring. And for those of you who are makers and creatives, I just want to validate that it is tiring work to do. And people may not think that even doing something, they may think something as simple as life drawing. Well, that's easy, it's relaxing, must be meditative for you. But to practice that kind of perception, to respond with accuracy to another body in a room, it's something that a lot of people don't have the stamina to do. So um, I just want to applaud you for um, your commitment to that work. You should give yourself a round of applause. Um, I'll be here for like two seconds afterwards. If you have something to say and you were kind of shy, you're like, mm, I didn't really want to speak in front of the group, feel free to zoom up to the front. And then, um, yeah, I'm off for the rest of my day. Thank you so much. Follow me on Instagram if you want to. And if you want to write me questions, I do write people back. Sometimes it takes me time, but I will get back to you. Awesome. Thank you.